Garrett Fitzgerald, former Prime Minister of Ireland, how would you describe this country to people in America these days? Oh, well, it's a small country. It's had a, an influence outside itself greater than you might think for its small size because so many Irish people have left and gone overseas to America and elsewhere. And because somehow or other we seem to breed a lot of literary talent. So our role in world literature is certainly disproportionate to our size. As regards our economy, it's a country with high unemployment, but actually um, successful in terms of output and exports and that. We, we just can't uh, get enough growth to um, employ the number of people who've been born here 20 years ago. That's the trouble. What's the state of the country at the moment? Well, there's an election campaign, of course, it's been on, and uh, that um, raises all kinds of uh, issues. Uh, politicians promise many things. I'm not there at present. I'm interested for the first time for many years to watch politicians promising from the outside. Uh, it's actually a bit disedifying. I, ho I hope it wasn't like that before, but I'm sure I did the same thing myself at times. What party are you in? Fine Gael, which is the principal opposition party linked in the European Parliament to the Christian Democrats. Would that be this link to the American Republican Party? <sighs> no, I don't think you can make an equation there. Certainly most Irish people, and certainly most people in my party, would consider themselves Democrats in America. Because our party has a social democratic and liberal element, as well as a, a solid conservative foundation. So I think we come near to the Democrats. What year were you Prime Minister years? Uh, 81 to 87, with a brief break in 82 of nine months. And if you go back to the, your, your own, where'd you start your politics? Well, my father w was in politics, and I suppose it the interest came from there. He was involved in a national movement for independence, as my mother was, and was a minister in the first government, having gone through the underground government period as director of publicity and editor of an underground newspaper. And uh, he was a minister for 10 years, and I was brought up there for the political background. So politics was a possibility for me. But I didn't enter politics till late in life. I was, in fact, uh, age 39 before I went in. What were you doing before? Well, after you know, my university career, I went into Aer Lingus for 12 years. I'd always wanted um, to be involved in the economic planning side of an airline, and I had that opportunity, and from the age of 25 on, I had the responsibility for that aspect of our national airline. And then I moved from that on to consultancy, lecturing, journalism, and gradually into politics. There's a note in, in uh, some biographical material that I've got that said that you figured out the size of the Russian Aeroflot by studying their, their uh, schedule. Yes, that that's true? right. In February 49, they made the mistake of publishing that full timetable in the ABC Air Guide. So I analyzed it backwards, what the scheduling was and the size of the airline, number of aircraft, where they were located, and wrote an article, which was actually the lead article in the English News Review magazine, the equivalent at that time of Time magazine in America. Uh, I, I certainly I managed to um, um, surprised the Russians. Uh, they weren't pleased, I think. They stopped publishing the timetables. And even three years ago when I was in Moscow and I inquired how big Aeroflot was, the head of Aeroflot wouldn't tell me at that time. It was still a secret. Uh, airlines and Aer Lingus, and it comes up in a lot of political literature here. Uh, when did the airline start? Oh, 1936. It was a state airline. Still is. Founded in that year by the government of the day has developed successfully since then. It's going through difficulties at present, but then what airline isn't, apart from British Airways? Uh, and it has um, operates a network uh, both to America, to Boston and New York at present, uh, but also to many places in the continent of Europe. How important has that airline been to the country? Very important. More than you'd think. First of all, we are an island, an island off the coast of an island, off the coast of Europe. So air transport plays a role which rail transport in other parts of Europe might play for similar distances. Uh, secondly, because we're a, a tourist receiving country with a big tourist industry, uh, to have a, an airline which is efficient and uh, offers you know low cost fares, as it does on certain routes from Britain anyway, uh, and to the United States, um, means that a uh, tourist industry can be built up in a way that might not be possible if we depended solely on foreign airlines. For a long time, I don't know what the situation is now, you could not fly directly from the United States to Dublin. You had to go to Shannon. This problem is still there, yes. Why? Well, the original route was from Shannon. The airport was built there because in 1935, the British, Canadian, and American governments and the Irish government decided that uh, flying boats would only be able to get that far across the Atlantic. So 
a flying base was built there, and then they thought that aircraft could only get that far, so they built an airport there. And of course then a aircraft developed, and it wasn't quite so necessary to have an airport at the very edge of Europe at Shannon. Uh, but it became um, an important regional industry there, and in order to protect it, governments have required that aircraft stop there on their way between Dublin and New York. I think myself it's a mistake. I hope it will change soon. Uh, there, many of the passengers, most of them, do want to go to or from Shannon because they're mainly tourists. But some people want to go direct to Dublin, and it's really ludicrous that if there are two flights a day from New York, one with the people who wanted to go to Dublin and one with the people who wanted to go to Shannon, they both must stop at Shannon. So I think that should be changed. Twelve years with Aer Lingus. Yes. Then the politics? No, no. I left to become a consultant and then I became an academic a lecturer in economics in the University College Dublin where I'd done my own degree, though my degree was not in that subject. And, um, and then I graduated into politics with journalism as well. I've always engaged in a lot of journalism, writing for papers overseas and representing the BBC, Financial Times, The Economist in Ireland and writing in, my, in the Irish Times a weekly column, which I had to abandon when in government, but I'm back writing it again now. I noticed you had one in this morning's paper. Yes. But the, a system that we don't understand, the proportional system or the way you elect your... Nobody understands it except the Irish. It doesn't exist in any other sovereign state in the world, I think. <laughs> Can you give us the basics? Well, there are constituencies of three, four or five seats. You vote for individual candidates, not parties, and you vote for them preferentially, one, two, three, four, five. Um, the votes, if somebody has too many votes, a share of their votes are passed on to the second preference. If somebody hasn't enough votes and they're eliminated, then their votes pass on to the next preference. So what you get eventually are, are the people who people most want, and you don't get the people whom you don't want. From that point of view, it's satisfactory to the public, because they have much more choice of politicians. There are problems with it, though, because it means that a politician of any given party is always in danger of being replaced by a colleague in the same constituency. So much of political activity is directed against one's own colleagues in the party, rather than against the other parties. And uh, that means a lot of local politics, a lot of um, concentration on local politics, and perhaps not enough on the national issues. How long have you been operating with this system? Oh, it was, and we were endowed with it before independence by the British, because in 1918 there was an election on the British system as part of the overall general election in the United Kingdom after the First War. And Sinn Féin, the Irish Independence Party, won 47% of the votes, but got 70% of the seats under the British system. The British decided their system was not suited to us, so they gave us proportional representation. They never had the good sense to introduce it for themselves, of course. You know, when we hear the, the, the word Sinn Féin or the two words Sinn Féin, it doesn't necessarily connote oh, no. good things. What, is the party still active in, in, uh, in well, the Republic of Ireland? It disappeared long ago in that form and was replaced basically by Fianna Foyle, which is the party that has been in government here for some years past, and indeed for much of the period since 1932. Uh, but um, the IRA revived, kept going, revived itself from time to time and reinvented Sinn Féin as a party, uh, particularly in the last 20 years or so. Let me ask you about leadership. Um, when was the first time you ever ran for office? Well, I ran in 65 for the Senate, but that's a rather unusual election by the county councillors and members of parliament. Um, the first time I ran for public office with the electorate generally was in 1969. Before we get off of that, uh, it is an unusual thing to even describe. How do you form your Senate? Well, 11 are appointed by, of the 60 are appointed by the Prime Minister. Six are elected by the university graduates of the two universities, three each. And the remaining 43 are elected on panels. Uh, nominated some by members of the Parliament, of Congress in your terms, some by vocational bodies, in, in, industrialists, uh, uh, farmers, trade unions and so on, and are then elected by the members of Congress and the local representatives throughout the country. So the average citizen has nothing to say about the Senate? No, he doesn't. How much power does the Senate have? Virtually none. It's unlike yours. It is a revising chamber which has the role of revising legislation which uh, the Doyle has passed, or sometimes of having a first bite at legislation before the Doyle does, but the Doyle can overrule it, and normally will. In any event, the Senate, because of the Prime Minister being able to appoint 11 of the members, um, the government always has a majority there. But it is useful because there are many bills that the other house, the Doyle, the main house, like your, your uh, House of Representatives, may not be particularly good at, at, at dealing with, or may not have time to deal with. And such bills then are dealt with very often very well in the Senate. I myself, when Prime Minister introduced a bill to establish a national archive, introduced it deliberately in the Senate, 
rather a very good debate, and many amendments were made to it. The Dáil had no great interest in other things in their minds than talking about archives. I go back to 69 when you, you were first elected in 69? Yes. Did you, have you spent from 69 until this year in Parliament? I have, representing Dublin South East, the corner of, the, of our capital city, which has our Parliament, and uh, my university also, my home, and my ministry when I was a minister. How big is your constituency? About two miles by three, very convenient. How many people? Uh, about 80,000. Well, 90,000 at the moment, I think. So what's the, the most number of people, actual people that have ever voted for you? Oh, oh Lord. Um, of the order of nine or 10,000, I think. I can't remember the exact figure offhand. So nine or 10,000 people are responsible for you eventually becoming That's prime minister? First preference votes. Then one gets other preferences, perhaps, if one needs them. <laughs> yes. And well, no, one becomes prime minister by being elected by the parliament, which emerges from that. But I mean, you elections. start, you have oh, yes. to get to the parliament that way. Yes. Um, how would you, what would you characterize your leadership traits that you used during the time you were prime minister? Well, I think that's better for other people to do. Um, well, let me ask it a different <laughs> way. What I was really getting at is, when you set about to do your job, what techniques do you use for leadership? Well, there are different aspects of leadership. I mean, it isn't simple. In our system, you have to lead your party. Well, that meant uh, organizing my party so I could win elections. That meant changing the organizational structure because it wasn't effective for that purpose. So there was an organizational job of the party to be done. And then one had to organize for an election. And in government itself, you have to choose and allocate, uh, allocate your ministers. And then you have to decide on your legislative program, bring your ministers with you, uh, try to get agreement on uh, what's to be done, lead them in some instances, uh, or follow their collective judgment in others, depending on the circumstances. Uh, let me just throw some things in, and you pick whatever you want. Uh, do you consider yourself a philosopher, a manager, a uh, leader by example? I mean, uh, do you have people that you've followed in your life, political, other political leaders that you want to... Uh, Not particularly. I, I don't have a sense of personal infallibility. Therefore, I don't think that I must be right about things and that everybody must follow me. There are some areas where I was sure of my judgment and felt because of my particular experience and background that I could offer a lead. I would expect other people to come with me in regard to Northern Ireland in particular. I think the, the policy I pursued was very much my policy, explained to my colleagues, backed by them, but I was the main initiator. In other areas of domestic policy, there might be areas in which I would not be particular expertise and I'd be very happy to listen to others. And in many of our decisions were taken collectively by a straw vote around the cabinet table, democratically. Uh, I, I, unless I was sure that I, you know, had a major, you know, was better equipped than others to, to um, put forward a particular policy, I would be inclined to take the views of my colleagues. I'd argue with them, argue my own point of view, but I'd be quite happy to be overruled. I would say happy, I'd be accept being overruled by a majority, and often was overruled by a majority. Um, and that way you bring a team with you. If you try and force their hand and force your views on them all the time, you won't, I think, get very far. Not with Irishmen, anyway. Well, when people went into the polls back when you were Prime Minister, did they vote for Garrett Fitzgerald, or did they vote for their local, I mean, in their minds in this country, do you vote for your local uh, representative, or do you vote for a national ticket? Both. Uh, and it's hard to distinguish the two. Uh, basically, people do vote for parties for government, but in their local choices, they can choose between representatives of the same party, and they also will be influenced by whether some person, perhaps of another party, has performed well in the area. But primarily, people are concerned with forming a government. At the moment, when the election's been taking place, they've been backing particular parties whom they want to see in government. Um, and uh, in, in our case, um, we put forward our policies, which were... Um, on Northern Ireland, uh, moderate policies seeking consensus and agreement uh, in social areas where liberal and issues like divorce, for example, by Irish standards in any event, and in social policy in terms of social welfare where uh, social democratic policies in terms of redistribution, but also policies based solidly on not borrowing too much money and balancing the budget reasonably closely and on trying to ensure that we uh, don't let our finances get out of hand. How much influence does America have on what Ireland does? Not a lot. <laughs> Nature of the things, I mean, in our own domestic affairs, we are, well, we're part of Europe primarily, and we're close to Britain, close to the rest of Europe. 
Obviously, there are issues in world policy where America influences us, even if we don't want it to, perhaps. But basically, we're a European country, and um, uh, we find the United States policies and attitudes often very different from ours because they spring from a different background, different history. When um, you read, or I'm sure you know this, that there are between 40 and 50 million Americans that consider themselves of Irish descent, what impact does that have on Irish? Well, uh, it has created um, both opportunities which we haven't always taken to mobilize, if you like, many of these people to support and help their homeland. It's also created some problems because there are quite a lot of Irish Americans who, who, whose grandparents perhaps came from Ireland in the British period and who still think of Ireland as you know, a former colony, who see Northern Ireland as a colonial war, and whose instinctive um, attitudes, which date back so far, can lead them in a minority of them to be supportive of the IRA and cause great problems for the democratic politicians of this country. So we have had to to argue our case in the United States and to try to ensure uh, that there isn't um, the, a misplaced sympathy with the IRA, uh, with the terrorists, and to ensure as far as possible that uh, the Irish American organizations, where Irish people are active in these organizations, uh, are supportive of our policies of trying to secure peace and stability in Ireland. Some factions in the United States um, are, I don't know what, I don't know how to characterize it, are, get very upset when they learn that an American politician is a member of the Trilateral Commission. And they also think that this conspiracy organization, they, 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 get, they get just as upset with the Council on Foreign Relations and the Bilderberg Group. I, I only bring it up because I notice that you're a member of the Trilateral Commission. We ask people in the, in the States that are members to explain why they are and what impact it has. Oh yes, it's seen as, as some people on the extreme right in the United States, or on the right, as being some kind of international left-wing conspiracy. It's seen in Europe by some people, by quite a lot of people on the left, as being some capitalist conspiracy. Uh, I don't know how these two extraordinary views emerged. I'm Deputy European Chairman uh, of the Trilateral. I've been involved with it really all the time I haven't been in government, and I was in opposition at various stages and am today. Uh, and I know the work it does. Uh, and. Um, I can't recognize it in either of these guises. What is it? It's an organization of people, David Rockefeller started it, to help to bring Japanese people, particularly more in contact with, Euro with Europeans and North Americans, as they became an important power, and to enable the three lots of people to sit down together and discuss common problems, examine them, commission reports, and discuss these reports. How often do you meet? Once a year at that level, and in Europe, a regional meeting once a year. One was held in Dublin just a month ago, our regional meeting, which was very successful. Um, and uh, what we've tended to do is to commission two reports. Uh, not always, this isn't, not always the method, but no, two reports uh, to be co-authored by somebody from each of the three areas who will then present this report um, to the group as a whole, listen to their views, make whatever adjustments they think, they think necessary, and publish them which seemed to me to be a reasonably um, uh, unobjectionable activity. Uh, this is a rather large question, uh, but what's your view of the state of the world? It's a very large question. Um, you can have as much time as you oh need. Yes, well, I mean, economically, obviously there are major difficulties because the, the fact that most major countries are in economic difficulty simultaneously creates a, a problem, which we haven't yet got out of. Uh, aggravated in Europe by the uh, problems created for Germany by German reunification, the pressures on the German economy, the failure to cope with these by financing part of that by taxation, overborrowing, pushing up interest rates. All that has caused great trouble for us in Europe. And in the United States, you've had your own problems of an unbalanced budget as well, and the problems of slow growth and something like recession. So from that point of view, it hasn't been a good period. We have to hope we come out of that soon, because it's been rather a long period of recession. Can you blame any one country for that? No. Well, you, every country, I suppose, has, has some part to blame. I mean, America, by not coping with balancing its budget and by the extraordinary reluctance to face the need for taxes, tax revenue to match expenditure, um, is part responsible. Germany, the same. The unwillingness to raise taxes to pay for German reunification, over-dependence and borrowing has created a problem there. And the British have not managed their economy well for a very long time. So I'm not saying that we've been perfect either, but what we do doesn't hurt other people as much as what they do because we're a very small country.
What about the rest of the world? What do you see the situation in Russia? Have you ever known many Russian leaders? Well, I was in Russia on an official visit in 1976, and I've been back there since then. Um, and I've been interested all my life in Russia. Indeed, had I done an MA after I finished my history degree, it would have been on Allied intervention in Russia in 1918 to 22. So it's a long-standing interest of mine. Um, I'm obviously v very concerned about what the developments there and in Eastern Europe generally. And I'm not sure that we've, you know, that the other rest of us in our economic difficulties have been willing and able to give as much help and as constructive help as we might have done to the problems of these countries. It's just, it is unfortunate that we're going through such a bad period economically just when these countries need help from us. And uh, uh, the problems of instability there are ones which touch us. Yugoslavia is not that far away. And the blood of Yugoslav refugees is causing problems, causing problems in Germany. And this impacts on us eventually too. So we do have major difficulties in Europe, political as well as economic. The European community endeavors to tackle these and it has, it has done a lot. Without it, we'd certainly be in a mess, but it has not been as coherent in tackling these problems. Or, uh, it hasn't worked as well together as it might have done. There are tensions between European states, between France and Germany, in addition to Yugoslavia, for example, which have prevented Europe from being as effective as it might be. And our job as Europeans is to get our act together, uh, work together as a team to tackle these problems, and be willing to put our hands in our pockets if necessary in a, for a few years to help sort them out. When you watch what's going on between France and the United States and the GATT talks, and what's your reaction to that? Well, I hope it is now settled and that there's no going back on it. And the French have a major problem. They have a very aggressive farm lobby, which is capable of quite violent action. And French governments have to do their best to master that, to jolly it along, to prevent it getting out of hand. And they also have an election coming up. It's an unfortunate moment for the French to try and handle that. And um, they have been intransigent because of the political pressures on them. Uh, but I think that most countries are very anxious that the gap problem sorted out. How many people does Ireland have under arms? Oh, an army of 12 or 13,000, a very small army, which is engaged, on the one hand, abroad in peacekeeping, in the Lebanon particularly, but with groups in many other areas under UN auspices, um, and at home in internal security, guarding the border against the IRA to prevent uh, terrorist action in that area, and also guarding um, banks and so on, or, or trans transfers of money against IRA raids, although these have been less prevalent recently than they were some years ago. What percentage of your uh, budget every year is spent on defense? Oh, it's very small. It's, it's less, about 2%. It's less than the, between 1 and 2%, 1.5 and, and 2%. It's less than the uh, European average. But we are a basically a peaceful country. We never uh, felt the need for a large army once we had sorted out our problems at the foundation of the state. My father's job, in fact, in his second ministry was cutting the army down to size, which he did. He was very unpopular with them. Do you have a favorite leader that you, over the years, in, uh, in world politics? Either one you've known or one you've followed? No, I don't. I just, my mind doesn't work in terms of putting people in order in that way. There are some people I've been impressed with and at times, and sometimes I've been impressed with them. They haven't turned out so good eventually. My judgment hasn't always been perfect in that respect. But there are people who have been very genuine in what they've been trying to do for their countries, and I respect them. Which American president have you known the best? Um, oh dear, I've met a number of them. But I haven't really had occasion to know them well. Um, I met President Carter only once, but I was impressed with um, uh, the way his government handled things, which was not the case with many Americans I know. And I thought Silas Vance was a very good Secretary of State and a much more open-minded than perhaps some others in regard to America's role in the world, more positive about America's role in the world. What's your reaction to our recent election and, and Bill Clinton? Well, I think, uh, like most Irish people, I'm an instinctive Democrat, so um, I'm pleased that he's won. But we all wait to see what the outcome will be in terms of his presidency. What do people here know about him? Oh, a fair amount, because News for America does take, you know, does play a large part in our papers, as it does throughout Europe. So, you know, we followed the campaign in considerable detail. And many Irish people who are very politically orientated and love election campaigns, so there isn't one on, at, one, one on at home, they'll certainly watch any campaign elsewhere. And many people have followed it with great interest in, you know, be mulling over how different states would vote in that. As um, you look to the change of government in the United States, 
what will you look for in an American president and the relationship to Ireland? What are the, the different moments that uh, will matter to you? Well, it always rises during an election when pressure is put on American presidents to, by some groups in the United States, to intervene in Irish affairs, uh, sometimes in a manner which would be unhelpful, because it is the mm, groups which support or are sympathetic to the IRA which tend to be the strongest pressure groups. And we always watch carefully to make sure that American president, uh, presidential candidates aren't got at to make promises of the wrong kind of action when they come into office. Um, it has been helpful to us in the past that American presidents have been interested in Ireland and willing to, to take up certain matters at certain times. For example, when I was engaged in negotiations with Margaret Thatcher and these got into difficulties or seemed to do so at the end of 1984, President Reagan did take the matter up with her in December of that year and again when he met her in, again in February. And I think that helped to encourage her to uh, have another look at the negotiations and to start them again on a more constructive basis. That was helpful. Uh, so, you know, w we like a friendly America which can help us at times, but we are concerned that American politicians are at a, any level are not misled into supporting people who are involved in violence in this country. Now, the 1985 Anglo-Irish Irish Anglo Agreement, uh, you had something to do with that? Yes, I initiated it and negotiated it and with the assistance of my government and civil servants and brought it to a successful conclusion. What's the bottom line from your standpoint of what that meant? What we were trying to do was to uh, weaken the IRA by giving to Northern Nationalists a focus for their loyalty within Northern Ireland through the presence of an Irish government presence there of some kind, uh, which would reduce support or tolerance for the IRA in Northern Ireland. I think the agreement contributed to that, although the IRA's support was already waning at that time. I think we had to, you know, increase that decline, if you like, to accelerate that decline in their support. And at the same time, uh, the agreement has had the effect of making unionists think seriously about talking to nationalists about finding a solution. And there have been talks recently. They haven't reached a conclusion at this stage, a successful conclusion, but they've sat down and talked together with the Irish and British governments for the first time. And I think those talks will will resume at some point. And I think that they might not perhaps have come about had it not been for the psychological impact of the agreement on unions. The IRA, the Irish Republican Army, is how many strong? Well, in terms of activists in Northern Ireland, estimated at about 500, I suppose. Supporters, a few thousand, a couple of thousand. Or, I mean, uh, a active supporters, a couple of thousand. And then supporters in terms of people who would like vote for the Sinn Féin party at elections, well, that's rather more, about 1% down here up to 10% in Northern Ireland, perhaps 5% in the island as a whole, who would give some tolerance to the IRA, and over 95% who hate its guts. Million and a half people in Northern Ireland. Yes. Three and a half million people in yeah. the Republic of Ireland. Mm -hmm. what, is there, will that problem between the two countries ever be solved? Yes, gradually, and probably in a rather complicated way, not by simple solutions which people always inclined to think of and perhaps to seek to impose from outside. But the common interest of the two parts of the country must in the long run prevail. The fact is, for example, within the European community, the interests of Northern Ireland and this part of Ireland are very similar and very, very different to the interests of Britain. And Northern Ireland would really be much better off if it could, if we could find some way of managing our affairs in the European community jointly, uh, rather than Northern Ireland having to work through a British government with different interests. Now, Unionists won't easily accept that because they fear that in some way it's going to weaken their their juridical link with Britain and their um, economic link with Britain. So, but at some point in the future, the logic uh, of the situation would suggest that without necessarily breaking the link with Britain, they organise their affairs in regard to the community at least jointly with us. So in that way, North and South could begin to work together and perhaps in our children or grandchildren's time, a different political regime will emerge, but it's been postponed, of course, for a very long time by the IRA. I mean, I did think 25 years ago that the two parts of Ireland might come together uh, in some political structure within about 25 years or 30 years. Nobody believes that now, because the damage done by the IRA in Northern Ireland is such that there's really nobody who believes we'd have a United Ireland at anything like that time scale. In your opinion, where does the IRA get its money? Well, in the past it's got from the United States, not so much now. Um, there are protection rackets and the resources that built up, it's built up in the past have been invested in 
sometimes in legal businesses, and it's, it's got quite a, a, a financial structure now. And it's also, of course, got a lot of arms and explosives from Colonel Gaddafi um, in Libya some years ago, in 85, 86, on a large scale, which he didn't have to pay for. And it got money from him also before that. So, different sources. But um, I think protection rackets and semi-legal businesses perhaps are now providing a high proportion of it. When you look at the literature of all the candidates for, uh, well, they're not candidates for prime minister per se, but all the candidates that, that uh, are running here in this country right now, almost everybody says jobs, 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 yes. the issue. What really can a politician do about creating jobs? Well, mainly create the conditions in which jobs will emerge favorable conditions by having a tax regime favorable to employment uh, for example and a tax regime is not as suitable as it might be for employment um, and uh, by uh, helping to ensure people are educated and trained for employment and then by uh, attracting industries here by creating a climate favorable to industries coming to this country but one shouldn't exaggerate what politicians can do basically the problem is demographic our birth rate in Ireland peaked in 1980, 15 or 20 years later than the rest of Europe. Um, there's a huge number of young people coming forward each year. If we were to try to eliminate unemployment and emigration within 10 years, we would need to have a growth rate of 10% per annum every year. Well, even in East Asia, you won't find countries that have achieved that. So you can't eliminate unemployment. But certainly we could, by, by improving our policies, we could... Um, uh, create more employment or create conditions which more jobs would be created and thereby gradually erode the level of unemployment which is now intolerable nearly 20 percent you said you retired from uh, at least elected political office what are you going to do now well I've always um, had a lot of different interests uh, in journalism and consultancy and at the moment I 